What is it you think you know about South Africa? Are you one of those that has been programmed by the media to believe that all white South Africans are evil, racists, that oppressed and enslaved the native population through the wicked apartheid laws? Do you believe that the people of South Africa now live in a wonderful rainbow nation full of tolerance and equality? Do you believe that white people should not inhabit South Africa as it is a black country and thus only for blacks? When informed of the ongoing genocide against white South Africans, is your automatic thought they deserve it? It is payback for stealing the land from the native blacks and oppressing them for centuries? If you truthfully answered yes to any of these questions, then we urge you to rethink all your preconceptions, open your mind and heart, and look, listen, and learn. Between Heaven and Hell, this is the true story of whites in South Africa. The first European to reach Southern Africa was the Portuguese Bartholomew Dias. Bartholomew Dias was a knight of the royal court, superintendent of the royal warehouses, and sailing master of the man of war, St. Christopher. King John II of Portugal appointed him on the 10th of October, 1487, to head an expedition to sail around the southern tip of Africa in hopes of finding a trade route to India. In early February 1488, they arrived at Mossel Bay. Here they came across a tribe of Khoi Khoi, also known as the Hottentot, who had a nomadic culture which included hunting and gathering. They spoke in a very distinct clicking sound found nowhere else in Africa. They had no written language, no horses, nor had they invented the wheel. Upon their arrival, Diaz and his crew were attacked and in retaliation, they shot one of the Hottentot with a crossbow, causing the people to flee in terror. The sailors immediately withdrew to their ships and the expedition sailed on eastward. The second European to reach South Africa was Vasco de Gama, a Portuguese explorer. The commander-in-chief Vasco de Gama embarked on the São Gabriel accompanied by his pilot, Pedro de Alenquer. For almost four months, they sailed across the Atlantic without sight of land, until the 4th of November, 1497, when they reached a bay. Vasco de Gama named the bay Bahai da Santa Elena, St. Helena Bay. Close to or near the mouth of the Berg River, the explorers set in to make repairs, look for water, and check their position. It was here that they had their first encounter with the Khoi Khoi. The Khoi Khoi attacked De Gama, wounding him in the thigh and also injuring his men. They set off again and four days later they arrived at Mossel Bay and found more Khoi Khoi at the same place that Diaz had landed. The Khoi Khoi showed their murderous mentality with most of the encounters. By 1510, the Portuguese had control of all the former Arab sultanates on the East African coast. In 1647, the Dutch ship New Harlem ran ashore in Table Bay. The captain left for the Netherlands on a ship that was on its return journey, but the junior merchant Lindert Janssen and 60 sailors had to stay behind. They did some gardening and game hunting and traded some livestock with the Khoi Khoi with whom they were on good terms. In 1648, a ship, the King of Poland, which was heading back to the Netherlands, stopped at Table Bay. On board was Jan von Riebeck, who was being sent back due to a charge of illegal trading in his own name. They spent 18 days for repairs and refreshments and picked up the stranded seamen of the New Harlem. On the 6th of April, 1652, Jan von Riebeck, accompanied by his wife, son, 82 men and 8 women on board the Dutch East India ship Dromedaris, docked at the southernmost tip of the dark continent of Africa. A few hours after von Riebeck anchored, the other two ships, the Reher and Good Hope, also anchored. Jan had signed a contract with the Dutch East India Company to oversee the setting up of a refreshment station to supply the company's ships on their way to the east with fresh water, vegetables, fruit, meat, and medical assistance. 
Jan von Riebeck was under strict instructions not to colonize the region, but to build a fort in the bay to help protect the refreshment station. The next group to arrive in South Africa were the French Huguenots. They were coming from Holland, which was flooded with French who were running away from the Catholic persecutions. The Dutch were trying to get rid of the French. These French were then sent to South Africa. The next group to arrive were called the Freeburgers. The name Freeburgers implied free men, thus they were not under the laws of the East India Company, nor the Dutch laws, nor the religious laws of any church. They were the heretics in Europe, and here also at the Cape. These people came to produce products which many of those who came earlier failed at dismally. In 1675, some of the Freeburgers started moving further away from the peninsula due to bureaucracy that was being forced onto them. They also became cattle and sheep breeders, and for this reason they needed larger spaces. The Freeburgers were later known as the Trek Boers due to them constantly moving further inland. Thereafter, they became known as the Border Boers when they arrived at the northeastern borders of the Cape. Hereafter, in 1836, they became known as the Immigrant Boers due to them moving out of the British colony. During the Great Trek, they became known as the Boers. By 1780, they started meeting up with the black tribes, mainly the Cosas, who started raiding the Border Boers' animals and started killing their people. By 1795, the British took over the Cape for the first time, which lasted until 1803. Then it was under the Batavian government, and in 1806, the British took control again. After the British final takeover, the border Boers started having trouble with the British because of the oppressive British laws, some of which hindered them from protecting their livestock, families, and property from the Cosas and other tribes. Some of the border Boers started with impact studies of the Northern Territories, looking for greener and free land where they could establish their own and get as far away from the British and missionaries as possible. The final straw that led to the Great Trek was the Sixth Cosa War from 1834 to 1835, when the Cosas invaded the colony. Following the Equality Article 50 of the British, which instigated more interracial marriages as all races were then seen as one and the same, many battles and annihilations between the Zulu nation and other tribes took place. They drove the non-Zulu blacks out of Botswana and into the Cape Colony. Dingaan, the then Prince of the Zulus, murdered King Shaka Zulu out of jealousy and took over the Zulu Kingdom in 1828. The first to have met the Zulu was Piet Ois in 1834 when he went on expeditions to investigate the northern lands before the Great Trek started. Piet Ois negotiated with Dingaan regarding the open land to the south between the Tugela and Umzumbuvu rivers. Dingaan agreed to sell this land to the Trekkers. The Boers did not want to rule over any black inhabitants, nor did they want war with them. All they wanted was a place to call their own where they could live peacefully away from the British and missionaries. When Ois returned home, he informed his people about the land that was waiting for them. British agents soon got wind of these plans and did not approve. They saw the Boers gaining their own land as a threat. The British then sent de Urban, a British general and colonial administrator, to speak with the missionaries who were traveling the countryside. The tribes were very trusting of the missionaries since they usually came bearing gifts and trinkets. Dr. Smith, a British scientist, was told by de Urban to go to the missionaries and get them to influence Dingon to see the Boers as enemies, thus people he did not want on his land. The missionaries told them that the Boers were the enemy and must be killed. In the decade following 1835, between 10 and 12,000 Trek Boers migrated into the interior, organized into a number of Trek parties under various leaders. The first Trek group was Louis Trichard and Johannes van Rensburg, who started to trek north in 1835. Then, in 1837, Piet Retief wrote a manifesto to the British government with their grievances for leaving the colony. A month later, in February of 1837, Retief and his crew started their trek heading north. Eventually, von Rensburg was killed in the Limpopo River area, and Trichard went to Mozambique in 1838, where he died from the malaria disease carried by mosquitoes, and their animals died from the tsetse flies. 
The trekkers set out in wagons which they called kokabin vans, or better known as jawbone wagons, because the shape and sides of a typical trek wagon resembled the jawbone of an animal. Most treks went over good terrain as they had studied the area for many years. Others, like Piet Retief and Gert Maritz, were trekker leaders, went partly over the mountains as they did not want to join the Boers in the Transvaal or the Orange Free State. The land through which they traveled was uninhabited and belonged to no one, but where Retief went, to Natal, belonged to the Zulus. The Retief trek moved to Taba Unku in the eastern Orange Free State, where all the other groups joined them. They were Sarel Siliers, Gert Maritz, Piet Ois, and Hendrik Potgeiter, who were made up of about 500 families. From Taba Unku, they moved to Tafelkop. Tafelkop. From here, Retief rode out east to Port Natal, where he went to speak with the British traders. When Retief returned from crossing the Tugela River, there was an American missionary by the name of Pastor Champion who warned Retief not to go back because Dingon would kill all of them. Retief did not believe that this would happen. Champion got his information from Dr. Smith, the British scientist. From here, he then went northwest to Dingon with the British interpreter Halstead. Unbeknownst to Retief and crew was the fact that Dingon had been told that they were enemies and must be killed. After discussions with Dingon, it was agreed that if Retief brought back his stolen cattle, stolen by Sekonyela of the Sutu tribe, he would make them a deal. Dingon used them so he wouldn't have to risk losing any of his people. He said that they could have the land between the Tugela and the Umzumbuvu and from the sea to the mountains. This uninhabited land was being used as a buffer zone between the Zulu and Kosa tribes, as they did not get along. The Kosa tribe inhabited the area south of the Umzumbuvu River, down to the colony. Retief returned with the cattle on the 3rd of February, 1838, assuming that since they kept the agreement, they would now get the land that was promised to them. Retief and his men were asked to leave their weapons outside of Dingon's hut while they came in to sign the agreement. Shortly after the signing, Dingon entertained them with his warriors dancing, having hidden the majority of the warriors in the 2,000 huts inside the crawl. Then the king screamed out, Bulala Abatagati, kill the wizards. Retief and his men were assaulted and dragged to a nearby hillside where the Zulu king ordered they be impaled. The hill was known as Klomo Amabutu, Skeleton Hill. After the murder of Retief, Dingon sent two regiments of his warriors to the upper Tugela River, where the Boer women, children, older men, and servants of Retief, Maritz, Pothiter, Siliers, and Ois were waiting in an encampment. He commanded his warriors to wipe out all of them, every single man, woman, and child. In the early hours of February 17, 1838, the Boer people were attacked and 40 men, 56 women, 184 children, and 250 servants, mostly colored people, were killed. Meanwhile, in the main camp on the 12th of December, bad news arrived that three British ships had come into Port Natal and landed with soldiers to disarm the Boers. By this time, the Boers had planned their attack against the Zulus in retaliation for what Dingon had ordered his warriors to do. Early in the morning, on the 16th of December, 1838, the battle commenced. They lined the wagons up in a D-shape, the half-moon section towards the rivers. The flat section of the D-shape was pointing towards the open Vled, where the Zulus were thus forced to stream in. A horde of between 10 to 15,000 Zulu warriors swept down on the wagons, being repulsed time and time again. The battle lasted for about three to four hours. Then the Zulus fled the field, leaving behind around 3,500 dead Zulus and only three lightly wounded boars. This battle is known as the Battle of Blood River. Then came the death knell for those Boer republics. Diamonds were discovered in the Free State. The British annexed this territory and it led to a period of discussions and arbitration which was overtaken by the British and they eventually paid the Orange Free State 90,000 pounds for the part of their country on which the diamonds were found. The First Anglo-Boer War of 1881 was instigated by Lord Carnarvon's agenda. He held a conference in London which was attended by Shepstone, who was the native commissioner in Natal at the time. 
Carnarvon laid out his plans to them on how to annex the Transvaal. Before Shepstone went to England for this meeting, the Zulus as well as the Petties were armed by the British. They held meetings and later decided to come together on the 8th of December 1880 for a people's meeting to solve this problem and raised the Virklir or four-color flag. On the 28th of January, 1881, the Battle of Langs Neck took place and the Boers defeated the British. On the 8th of February, the Battle of Skyens Wuchta took place. Again, the British were defeated. Then, on the 27th of February, the final, most devastating battle took place at Mayuba. Unfortunately here, Piet Hubert delayed the signing of the peace treaty, which gave the British time to rearrange their tactics and conditions. When Hubert asked for Kruger to come down for the peace treaty signing, he could have had them sign unconditionally, but withheld it until Kruger arrived after weeks. The outcome was that the British still had control of the Boers' foreign policy outside the Western Front. The British urge to control the world, its finances and mineral resources, plus the hate for the Boers due to the humiliating defeat of the British by the Boers at Mayuba, was a threat to British power, not just local in southern Africa, but also worldwide. The Jameson raid was planned by powerful men like Cecil Rhodes and Barney Bernardo, the Jew. They planned the overthrow and takeover of the Boer republics. This world control was known as Pax Britannica. These men were used to orchestrate a takeover of the Boer government in the Transvaal. After a telegram sent by German Kaiser to President Kruger was leaked to the British, it was evident that the Germans were on the side of the Boers. It infuriated the British, who stepped up their plans to further the war. And after secret talks between the British and Germans, the Transvaal eventually purchased a lot of weapons from Germany, as Kruger saw the future quite clearly. This failed raid infuriated the British government, led by Chamberlain, who then sent Sir Alfred Milner out to the Cape to further their plans of takeover. They used the control over the feelings of the population in the Cape to further the cause to eventually start the Second Boer War. They then started with a buildup of troops on the borders of the Transvaal from Natal, Rhodesia, and Botswana. The Orange Free State was at the time still a buffer zone between the Cape and the Transvaal. After all negotiations failed, the Transvaal government sent an ultimatum to England on the 9th of October 1899 to withdraw all its troops from the borders, which the British refused. The Boers struck first on the 12th of October 1899 by attacking the Cape and Natal. The British thought that the war would be over before Christmas of 1899. After this initial defeat of the British by the Boers, General Redvers Buller was sent out with some 50,000 troops. After Buller's losses, the British sent out Field Marshal Lord Roberts in January 1900 and 180,000 more troops. There was already 240,000 troops in Southern Africa. The Boer total population was about 180,000 men, women, and children, including the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Troops then started pouring in from all Commonwealth countries and eventually amounted to 504,000 troops. These troops were comprised of English, Scots, Welsh, Irish, Indians, Australians, New Zealanders, and Canadians that came from all around the world, as well as Afrikaners from the Cape. The Afrikaners in the Cape asked Robert's permission to join with the British in the fight against the Boers, and some 30,000 joined up. This truly should have been labeled the First World War. The Transvaal Constitution forced its citizens to go to war and also those residents who were not citizens but had lived there for more than four years. It was due to this law that the Cape Dutch, or Afrikaners, were forced to join the Boers in this fight. They were the first who joined the British inside the Transvaal, about 26,000, and became known as joiners and hands-uppers. There were also some Boers who gave in, but very few. As one can clearly see when looking at the British Parliament records of the time, there would have been no war against the Boer if the Cape Dutch would have joined the Boers. The Boers developed guerrilla tactics to attack the British columns. Every farmhouse was a supply source for the Boers who could rest up, restock their saddlebags, and go back to fighting. In retaliation, the British instituted a scorched earth policy, where they burnt all the farms, 
about 40,000 farmhouses and barns. Even cattle and sheep were killed en masse. They rounded up the women and children and put them in concentration camps. There were about 67 camps where the Boers were kept. There were also an additional 75 camps that were for the blacks in southern Africa. At the start of the camps, the blacks were put into the same camps as the whites. They were later separated. They were called the Daimak Volk. It means those blacks that worked on the farms, thus not part of those who helped the British fight the Boers. We are always told about the 45 camps for the Boers, but the camps for the blacks were hardly ever mentioned, nor ever known. Why would this be? Does it not fit in with the narrative of blacks versus whites? The people in the camps died of starvation, disease, and neglect. There were about 15,000 blacks who died in concentration camps. The black people's animals were also killed and their possessions on the Boer farms were burnt to the ground. 50% of the total Boer child population was killed in these camps. This is about 16% of the total Boer population. British agents Jan Smuts and Louise Botha instigated a truce with the British. Both were born British citizens, Smuts in the Cape and Botha in Natal. Before the war, Botha had moved from Natal to the Freiheit Republic, which was part of the Transvaal, so as to be able to infiltrate the Boer ranks. The Second Boer War was ended with the signing of the Treaty of Vereeniging. In 1907, after the Boers threatened a third Boer-Anglo war, they were given self-government as mentioned in Article 7 of the Peace Treaty, but they did not have their own and free elections. The treaty stated that the Boers could have self-government, but of course this was just a lie. Smuts and Botha immediately began work on the unification of South Africa, and by 1909 they sent the documents to England where the Parliament approved them. No Boer was ever asked in elections nor referendum regarding this unification. On the 31st of May 1910, the Union of South Africa was institutionalized as per the Union Convention and the Boers became a minority inside a majority Afrikaner or Cape Dutch and English population. The name Cape Dutch, which was used for those white Afrikaans speakers in the Cape, as written by many, in many a book, worldwide, can be seen even today. They were colonists. This was how the Boers also referred to them. The British, also colonists, lived mainly in the Cape, which they took over from the Dutch, and Natal, which they annexed from the Boers and Zulu. But after 1910, the terminology of Cape Dutch and Boer was replaced with the term Afrikaner. The term Boer seems to disappear overnight, never to be mentioned again. The Native Land Act of 1913 was written by J.B.M. Herzog, a so-called Boer general who was really Jewish. He was in the governments of Louis Botta and Jan Smuts. The blacks were also given 10 million hectares of Boer soil. This was the first major piece of segregation legislation passed by the Union Parliament. It was replaced by the current policy of land restitution. The act decreed that whites were not allowed to buy land from the natives and vice versa, natives were not allowed to buy land from the whites. After the war, the British opened the borders for the blacks to stream into the Boer republics so they could be used as cheap labor on the mines. The African National Congress was formed in South Africa on January 18, 1912, when a group of Africans, coloreds, and Indians covened a meeting in Bloemfontein to create the South African Native National Congress. The name was officially changed to the African National Congress in 1923. This was initially a moderate movement aimed at improving the status of non-whites in South Africa whose lives had been affected by the Land Act. South Africa officially introduced territorial segregation in 1913. The ANC unsuccessfully petitioned the British government to intervene. Britain did not respond to two subsequent delegations sent in 1914 and 1915. Yet, the ANC continued this reformist approach for much of the 1920s and 1930s. In 1940, ANC President Alfred Zuma aggressively recruited younger members, including Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, and Walter Sisulu. In 1944, the three spearheaded the formation of a youth league committed to more radical strategies to challenge racial segregation and discrimination. 
On the 14th of December 1960, the UN Resolution 1514 was signed as an international law. The British were also bound by this law, whereby all colonies were to get their independence back unconditionally. Revord and Alfred Beit, the Jew and Afrikander Broderbonder, turned the South African Union into the South African Republic by instructions from the British, whereby it allowed the further plundering of the Boer Republic's resources by the British and Jews. As time goes on, we start to see Jewish infiltration and subversion of the ANC, and in 1963, it consisted of Lionel Bernstein, Bob Heppel, Dennis Goldberg, Arthur Goldreich, Hazel Goldreich, and James Cantor, with a few African frontmen, Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Govan Mbeki, Raymond Malaba, and Ahmed Kathrada. The ANC followed the model the Jews established when they founded the NAACP in the United States, with the exception that the ANC was a much more violent and openly communist organization. These Jews and their now-controlled African National Congress received funding and support from both the Soviet Union and the U.S. CIA. In particular, Ruth First, the Jewish wife of Jewish Soviet KGB Colonel Joe Slovo, a leader of the South African Communist Party, was primarily responsible for funneling funds to this African National Congress. By the 1970s, the Jewish campaign to subvert South Africa was having no effect. The economy was unaffected by sanctions and communist unrest was minimal, though much was made of it in the Jewish-owned elements of the U.S. press. Slovo had been the planner of many of the ANC terrorist attacks, including the 1983 car bomb that killed 19 people and injured many others. Slovo, who had traveled to the Soviet Union many times, was awarded a Soviet medal on his 60th birthday. Slovo is a dedicated communist, a Marxist-Leninist, without morality of any kind, for whom only victory counts, whatever the human cost, whatever the bloodshed. Slovo disputes little of his image as the communist mastermind behind the ANC's armed struggle. For him, the fears of South Africa's whites are both a measure of the ANC's growing strength and a crucial factor in hastening what he believes will be its ultimate victory. Revolutionary violence has created the inspirational impact that we have intended, and it has won for the ANC its leading position, Slovo said. The hatred for whites increased daily, and soon the blacks were singing songs taught to them by Slovo and his radical cohorts about how they were going to kill the Boer and kill the racist.
Mr. Mandela, can you tell us how you feel visiting this spot at this time? It is a very emotional moment for us. That those who are fighting for democracy, for peace, for love among South Africa, should be mowed down. once more turned its back on whites in South Africa and told them that if they didn't like it there, they should leave. But where were they to go since the whole world despised them? The ANC tried to convince the public that the MK terrorists were actually freedom fighters. Hotels, restaurants, and many other public places were bombed on a regular basis. Riots would break out across the cities with many killed. In 1983, the Church Street bomb was detonated in Pretoria near the South African Air Force headquarters, resulting in 19 deaths and 217 injuries. The bomb was set to explode at rush hour to maximize casualties of white women, children, and babies. During the next 10 years, a series of bombings occurred in South Africa, conducted mainly by MK. In the 1985 Amanza Matodi bombing of the Natal South Coast, five civilians were killed and 40 were injured when MK cadre Andrew Sibusisu Zondo detonated an explosive in a rubbish bin at a shopping center shortly before Christmas. In a submission to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, TRC, the ANC stated that Zondo's act, though understandable as a response to recent South African Defense Force raid in Lesotho, was not in line with the ANC policy. Zondo was subsequently executed. In the 1986 Durban Beach front bombing, a bomb was detonated in a bar, killing three civilians and injuring 69. Robert McBride received the death penalty for this bombing, which became known as the Magoo's Bar Bombing. The subsequent Truth and Reconciliation Committee called the bombing a gross violation of human rights. McBride received amnesty and became a senior police officer. In 1987, an explosion outside a Johannesburg court killed three people and injured ten. A court in Newcastle had been attacked in a similar way the previous year, injuring 24. In 1987, a bomb exploded at a military command center in Johannesburg, killing one person and injuring 68 personnel. The terror campaign continued with attacks on a series of soft targets, including a bank in Rudport in 1988, in which four civilians were killed and 18 injured. Also in 1988, a bomb outside a magistrate's court killed three. At the Ellis Park Rugby Stadium in Johannesburg, a car bomb killed two and injured 37 civilians. A multitude of bombs at restaurants and fast food outlets, including wimpy bars and supermarkets, occurred during the late 1980s, killing and wounding many people. 
the area of Wimpy was specifically targeted because of their perceived rigid enforcements of many apartheid laws, including excluding non-whites from their restaurants. Several other bombings occurred with smaller numbers of casualties. This tactic was abandoned due to the high rate of civilian casualties, especially amongst black laborers. The ANC estimated 30 landmine explosions resulting in 23 deaths, while the government submitted a figure of 57 explosions resulting in 25 deaths. It is a common misconception that the ANC's leader in the 1994 South African elections, Nelson Mandela, had been jailed for his political beliefs. He was in fact acquitted of treason after a four-year trial, but re-arrested a few years later and sentenced to five years imprisonment for launching an armed insurrection as founder and commander-in-chief of the MK. In his book, Long Walk to Freedom, Mandela says he signed off on many acts of terrorism, including the Church Street Massacre. He told the black youth of South Africa to burn down their schools and refuse to learn Afrikaans, producing a lawless, unemployable generation. But in the rest of the world's eyes, everyone thinks he is a true hero. Mandela conspired not just to bring down the government, he was planning on killing tens of thousands of civilians in his quest for power. He was later charged with 193 counts of terrorism for sabotage and for trying to smuggle, prepare, or manufacture mostly Soviet bloc munitions, including 210,000 hand grenades, 48,000 anti-personnel mines, 144 tons of ammonium nitrate, 21.6 tons of aluminum powder, and 1,500 timing devices. These multiple charges were not trumped up political charges. In his eloquent closing statement to the court, Mandela candidly admitted his guilt on the charges of sabotage, adding that he was, if need be, prepared to die for his ideals. It was apparent from the huge amount of smuggled explosives that he was not planning to die alone. The judge at his trial commented that personal ambition may well have played a role in his plans. Mandela was never tortured during either of his interrogation or incarceration as he undoubtedly would have been in a black African nation. Even Amnesty International refused to take on Nelson Mandela's case because they asserted that he was no political prisoner, but had committed numerous violent crimes and had a fair trial and a reasonable sentence. When Mandela was incarcerated, he was given a nice house to live in that was not only comfortable, but luxurious. He had free access to telephone and a fax at the expense of South African taxpayers, which allowed him to organize the ANC from jail. This is why Mandela was still their leader upon being released from jail. He was supposedly in jail for more than 20 years. Not only did he encourage terrorism against whites, but he and his wife Winnie Mandela implemented a torturous practice called necklacing. For any black dissidents, they would have a mob of ANC blacks beat the dissident, put a gas-filled tire around their neck, and light it on fire, all the while making it impossible for the victim to escape. President P.W. Botha told Mandela back in 1985 that he could be a free man as long as he did one thing, publicly renounce violence. Mandela refused. The bottom line is that Nelson Mandela never publicly renounced violence, and we should never forget that. Towards the end of Mandela's time in prison, he began talks with the government. When President Botha suffered a stroke and was forced to resign, F.W. Deplore took the reins. Mandela and Deplore made parliamentary moves to pave the way for the ANC to get together and negotiate. When Parliament opened that following February, Deplore announced that all political parties were to be unbanned and all prisoners released. On February the 11th, 1990, Mandela was freed. Upon Mandela's release from prison, he and Winnie divorced and he had to pay millions of dollars in settlements. The obvious question is, where did this money come from if he had been sitting in jail for decades? Mandela then moved into an even more luxurious house in Johannesburg, but kept a small shack in Soweto for when he needed to do interviews and appearances. This way he could create the illusion that he was poor when he was anything but that. In 1989, a year before Mandela was freed, Frederick de Klerk, a Freemason with ties to B'nai B'rith, the Jewish Masonic fraternity which controls the ADL, was elected president of South Africa. President Frederick de Klerk was a Jewish-backed candidate with ties to the International Zionist establishment. De Klerk worked for and eventually achieved the Jewish goal of black rule in South Africa. 
supposedly competing with the ANC for a say in the future of South Africa, were de Klerk's National Party as well as the rival Nkartha Freedom Party headed by Zulu Badi led by Chief Butalesi, as well as conservative white groups who did not want apartheid to end. There was lots of rhetoric from de Klerk and the ANC about finding a way for all South Africans to be equal and live in peace and harmony. The white South Africans were told that they were voting for equality, which is something they deemed important, as they did not wish to rule over the blacks, but simply wanted to preserve their culture and way of life. With a huge increase in terrorist bombings and severe pressure from the rest of the world closing in on them, the populace grew tired of the apartheid state and longed for an end to this as they considered that the world might open their arms to them again. They did not know that they were voting for their own genocide. If they had known this, they most certainly would not have voted for their inevitable fate of mass killings and rapes. And so convinced they had no other option, the whites of South Africa essentially handed over control of their country to the ANC in 1994. South Africa had moved from the system of apartheid to one of majority rule. Following the election of April 27, 1994, Nelson Mandela was sworn in as South Africa's president. Its cabinet made up of 12 ANC representatives, six from the National Party and three from the Nkatha Freedom Party. Thabo Mbeki and F.W. de Klerk were made deputy presidents. The world rejoiced at the end of apartheid. We were told that South Africans were going to be living hand in hand in a wonderful rainbow nation. But while blacks appeared to rule, it was Jews in key positions. When Nelson Mandela's ANC took over South Africa, Slovo was named Minister of Housing, Helena Dolny, the Jewish ex-wife of Slovo, ran the land bank, Ronnie Casseroles, a Jew, was the Minister of Water Affairs and Forestry, Luis Tager, a Jew, was Chairman of the Railway System, Spornet, Michael Katz, a Jew, was the Chief Consultant on Taxation, Mayor Khan, a Jew, was the Managing Director of the Police Service, three Jews, Richard Goldstone, Arthur Chaskelson and Albert Sachs sat on the South African Supreme Court. Immediately, the government embarked on the Reconstruction and Development Program to address what they deemed socioeconomic consequences of apartheid, which really just meant a major operation in wealth redistribution translating to whites having their small bit of wealth stolen from them and given to blacks. This program was really just an affirmative action policy for the majority of the population, black Africans. Even though whites were the minority, they were oppressed and blacks, along with other non-white races, were given a leg up over the white minority who were now being targeted for extinction. The Constitution of the Republic of South Africa was established in 1996. Mandela's government also established a criminal law code on the European model, abolition of the death penalty, and excessive rights for accused criminals with destructive results. South Africa today competes with civil war-torn Colombia for the dubious distinction of being the world's most crime-ridden country. Interpol's international crime statistics say it all. In 1999, South Africa had 121 murders and 119 mostly white women rapes per 100,000 inhabitants, compared with Colombia's 69 and 6 respectively, and the United States 5 and 32. The trends are no more encouraging considering that in 1994 the world's average murder rate was 5.5 per 100,000 compared to South Africa's 45. In such circumstances and with a slow justice system which only produces a 10% conviction rate, South Africa has seen the rise of vigilante groups filling the void left by an incompetent and violent police who between the three years of 1997 and 2000 killed 1,550 people compared with 2,700 killed by the apartheid regime in 30 years. This is what the saintly Nelson Mandela helped to usher in. After one term as president, he stepped down in 1999, though he still served as an icon around the world for tolerance and diversity, since all of his crimes before and after coming to power were swept under the rug in the mass media. Mandela was followed by other radicals who oversaw the destruction of a once beautiful and safe South Africa, such as Thabo Mbeki from 1999 to 2008. Kalima Molante for less than a year and Jacob Zuma ever since. It was Zuma who announced the death of Nelson Mandela in December 2013. 
World leaders from all over flew into South Africa to congregate and mourn with Zuma. While the media cried about the loss of such a hero for civil rights, since then Mandela has essentially been deified by those who never say anything of his terrorist past or the genocidal policies he implemented. Of course, not making it to the TV screens of the world were the songs of Kill the Boar, Kill the Racist that continue to be sung by Zuma and his followers. Zuma is known for being an extremely corrupt leader. He was charged with rape in 2005 but was acquitted. He fought a long legal battle over allegations of racketeering and corruption, which resulted in his financial advisor Shabir Shaikh's conviction for corruption and fraud. On April the 6th, 2009, the National Prosecuting Authority dropped the charges, citing political interference, although the decision has been challenged by opposition parties, and as of 2016, the matter is still before the courts. After extensive state-funded upgrades to his rural homestead at Nakandla, the public protector found that Zuma had benefited improperly from the expenditure, and the Constitutional Court unanimously held in 2016's Economic Freedom Fighters versus Speaker of the National Assembly that Zuma had failed to uphold the country's constitution, resulting in calls for his resignation and a failed impeachment attempt in the National Assembly. This is par for the course of South African governance in the post-apartheid era. Corruption is rampant at all levels, from the politicians to the police. The police are comprised of mostly black Africans who are hostile towards whites and treat the whites unfavorably. They do not care about solving crimes committed against white people or in stopping black-on-black -black violence either and are simply opportunists looking to gain riches easily. Just as any concerned citizen under attack would do, the whites will call the police when they are being broken into or stolen from. But the police are just as corrupt as the thieves. They will cover for the criminals and look the other way while whites are being targeted. Now the country has regressed to third world status in a matter of years. The situation only continues to get worse for all residing in South Africa. South Africa went from being a beautiful first world country with top of the line hospitals and a very high standard of living for not only whites but blacks as well, to a third world hellhole. Before the end of apartheid, work was plentiful for both blacks and whites. Their streets were safe. Now everything is falling apart. Due to enforced affirmative action laws where non-whites are given preferential treatment, despite their capabilities to perform the job, South Africa has experienced a rapid decline in all of its industries, military, and infrastructure, with rolling blackouts where the power will be shut off for hours at a time. This happens almost daily. This is now commonplace in black-run South Africa, posing yet another security risk to South Africans. If white South Africans have a bit of money, they can barricade themselves behind electric fences and barbed wire to protect themselves from home invasions. But during a rolling blackout, which happens very frequently, these fences are rendered useless, as are the security systems. Some of the most horrific and unimaginable horrors take place when they are vulnerable like this, especially since gun laws make it virtually impossible to obtain a firearm. Without these security measures, the whites are sitting ducks. Whites are being murdered in the most sadistic and sickening ways imaginable. They are not just killed, but are tortured for days. For example, a group of blacks will wait for the children to come home from school and will tie the children up. Once the mother arrives at home, they will tie her up as well. They will wait for the father to come home and then tie him up also. They will then begin to torture and rape the mother and children in front of the father while he is tied up, unable to help. They will pour hot oil on the children, rape them with broken bottles, disembowel them and light them on fire. They will often leave the father alive so he has to live with these horrific images replaying through his mind for the rest of his life. Around three o'clock in the morning, suddenly there was, Mama, I need your help at our bedside. Bev sleeps in her clothes because she expects to be woken up at any time. 
It's no longer coming home in a serene place where just everything falls off. I'm coming home on a beautiful day, sun is shining. I have friends who are nervous about coming to my house. And every single window is locked. Two doors in front are locked. Stay locked in my room if I'm alone. I don't go outside. They broke through the glass on this window, trying to get out as fast as they could. I opened my eyes, switched on my pedestal light and looked into the face of men. Four men wearing balaclavas in big thick clubs. I didn't have a front door. Looking up at me like this. He was lying flat on the ground. He held my wrist uh, very strongly. I went to my son and it, it took a while to realize that he was bleeding. So I recognized the voices but they also recognized me. And I think at that point this bell was ringing, I was screaming, you were hitting, the alarm was blaring, time was ticking. He had this gash on his cheek and I tried to stop the bleeding. They came to kill Craig. No matter how hard I pushed it, it just would not stop. And to rape me. And I think after five, ten minutes, it stopped moving. There are an estimated 50 plus murders per day in South Africa. These are not crimes of opportunity. The majority of the time, the blacks will not steal one single item. The whites are not just murdered because they want their farms or property, but they are murdered simply due to a severe hatred toward the white people, and it involves torture, humiliation, and rape. The white farmers are the ones who are particularly targeted. They are more easily targeted than the other whites because most of the time they live in isolation and are far away from any neighbors that could intervene. Another reason for some of the horrors inflicted upon the innocent white children of South Africa is that the witch doctors of the African tribes will actually tell their people that in order to cure AIDS, they need to rape white babies and the blacks actually do this. It is not just the incredible amount of murder that is leading to the genocide of whites in South Africa, but the anti-white policies mentioned already. White men were forced from their jobs first, but soon after the white women were not able to get jobs either. With no help from the world and no jobs to make a living, many of these impoverished whites were forced into squatter camps where they live in makeshift shacks on top of a trash heap. The squatter camps that the whites are forced to live in are some of the worst conditions you can imagine. The government has provided them with only a few steel walls to erect a small structure, although these structures have no windows, ventilation, or flooring. 300 plus people have to share one outhouse and one water spigot. They are unable to grow any food for themselves due to the drought and lack of clean water. They are given no help from their government or from the UN and other humanitarian groups. Babies are born on top of a trash heap with hardly any food to eat. What is your name? John. John, John how old are you? 11 years old. 11 years old. Um, I hear that you had a break-in in your home. Yes, they steal my bike and my dad's generators and his stool. They stole your bike generator and you stole, so now you don't have a bicycle anymore? Yes. How did you feel when they, they broke in? I was very sad. They, they stole my bike and I was very sad. You were very sad. Oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Were you scared? Yes. Oh no. Well, um, I, I, I thank you for, for talking to me and we'll try and make a plan and see if we can't find you a new bicycle. Okay. Alright, thank you sweetheart. Hi, what is your name? Enrico. Enrico, how old are you? Fifteen, about sixteen this year. This year, okay. Um, Enrico, how do you feel about what's going on in South Africa as a young person growing up here? Well, to be honest, I... I'm actually scared of what my future is going to be like. Is it? Um, why do you say that? There's too much black people and not enough white people in this country. Mm -hmm. and, and why does it affect you so much? Um, is it because of the violence and the farm murders and the home invasions? Yes. 
How do you feel about the farmers that are being butchered like this? It makes me angry. Mm -hmm. And I don't want it to happen to everyone except that they must stop killing us, they must stop helping us and not want to kill us. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about um, the education in South Africa? There must also be enough education for the blacks as there are for the whites. Mm -hmm. You want the same equal opportunities, is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Okay. Um, how is your home life? Um, does your dad work? No, he's... He lost his job? Yes, uh, in February. In February, oh, that's awful. So, um, I presume you guys suffer and struggle with food every day? How do you feel when you when you see your parents struggle to, to support you guys? It makes me sad. Um, what do you want to be when you grow up? A motor mechanic. A motor mechanic, wow. Um, do you think that you'll find a job in South Africa after studies? No. Why do you say that? Because the black people are taking over all the jobs in the so you see no future for yourself here. Yeah? And if, if given the opportunity, would you, um, after your studies maybe, would you want to go and live and work in another country? No. No. I'd rather work here, but if I must, I will go work here. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for talking to me, and I wish your family all the best of luck. The squatter camps are often flooded during the rainy season, which renders their small structures useless. When people are told about the conditions that these whites are forced to live in, they tell them that they either deserve it or that they should just leave if they don't like it. These people don't even have enough money to buy a loaf of bread, let alone a plane ticket to a new country or enough money to start a new life for themselves. There are an estimated 80 white squatter camps in the Pretoria area alone. We are fighting for our language, we are fighting for jobs. So uh, my feeling is that we are only fighting all the time to, to survive. Across South Africa as a whole, there are an estimated 400,000 whites living in these conditions. Census figures suggest an estimated 8,000 white households live in shacks. Since the world has fallen silent on this ongoing genocide, the white South Africans have nowhere to go and are forced to rot away without food, water, safety, or shelter. Genocide Watch has declared genocide in South Africa and the whites are currently in stage six. There are only eight stages. Black students are burning down their universities and attacking white students for colonizing their education. White students are attacked and harassed just for attending university. These whites are facing complete extinction and the world has turned its back on them. There is a complete media blackout when it comes to the genocide in South Africa. Only a few brave outlets dare to cover this situation. The powers that be wish for this bloodbath to be kept in the dark so that white people around the world won't learn the truth and try to help, or even realize that what is happening in South Africa is now coming to their own doorstep. The powers that be have the exact same fate in store for every single white country. This is not just about annihilating whites from South Africa, but exterminating whites off the face of this earth for good. This plan has been stated by many in their own words. I think there's a resurgence of anti-Semitism because at this point in time, Europe has not yet learned how to be multicultural. And I think we're going to be part of the throes of that, of that transformation, which must take place. Europe is not going to be the monolithic uh, uh, societies that they once were in the last century. Jews are going to be at the center of that. It's a huge transformation for Europe to make. They are now going into a multicultural mode, and Jews will be resented because of our leading role. But without that leading role and without that transformation, Europe will not survive. And the one idea is how we are going to exterminate white people, because that, in my estimation, is the only conclusion I have come to. We have to exterminate white people off of the face of the planet to solve this problem. There are two issues at the top of our agenda at the very moment. Uh, one is 
the unbelievably important immigration debate in this country, to make sure that immigrants from around the world, particularly those from south of our border, have a chance here. My concern is, uh, is doing away with whiteness. Whiteness is a form of racial oppression, sure. The suggestion is that it is somehow possible to separate whiteness from oppression, and it is not. There can be no white race. Essentially what you're saying is that in this boat you're together with uh, both Muslims uh, yes, yes, yes. and people of other and, nations. And uh, we see ourselves together, uh, fighting together with uh, our Muslim brothers who, are, who want a free Europe, who want a peaceful Europe, who want to uh, integrate like our forefathers integrated in Western Europe 120 years ago, and uh, they are our natural allies. Quel est l'objectif? Ça va faire parler, mais l'objectif, c'est relever le défi du métissage. Défi du métissage que nous adresse le 21e siècle. Ce n'est pas un choix, c'est une obligation, c'est un impératif. On ne peut pas faire autrement. HAC has always worked on the premise that as a minority, um, our security, our strength, our well-being in America is interdependent with those of other minorities. This is a Jewish issue. It is very much a Jewish issue. The Honorable gentleman says that he's going to take in four, uh, 20,000 refugees over five years. The Germans took in 10,000 on one day. What kind of comparison is that? I recognize the financial problems, I recognize the assimilation problems, but if we don't do it now, we will live to regret it for the rest of our lives. The message from my constituents in a huge post bag and in every event I attended in my constituency the weekend is, let them in. There's a second thing in that black box, an unrelenting stream of immigration, non-stop, non-stop. Fewer than 50% of the people in America, from then and on, will be white European stock. That's not a bad thing. That's a, that's a source of our strength. Instead of taking in the very people who need refugee status the most, Europe has taken in millions of Arab and black African men of fighting age. These are not refugees. They are an invading army that is being used by world Jewry as a communist proxy army to do the dirty work for them, so that they can place blame solely on the Arabs and black Africans as they remain hidden behind the scenes, pulling the strings. They are inciting an invasion and anti-wide violence in America, as well as at the same time, employing affirmative action policies to discriminate against whites, who now make up a minority of the births. Whereas whites once had a high standard of living in our lands and were able to flourish in a safe environment, we have since been thrown under the bus by our own governments, who we thought were there to safeguard our interests. The time is now. We have got to raise awareness about the ongoing white genocide in South Africa, as well as the earthwide white genocide taking place in every corner of the world. Share this video with everyone you know. Take to the streets and let the world know about this hidden genocide. Go to whiteresistance.org for free activist material. Demand action from your politicians. Let the world know about this best kept secret. Together, we can stop the biggest genocide ever attempted in history. Separate, we are weak. But united, we can accomplish anything.